Lobby. <laughs> lobby for your lobby gobblers. Yes. Right, we're going to have a game of guess the show and guess the theme tune. And I can't whistle, so it could be embarrassing. Sam. Yeah, that's right, it's Jim Pitt Village where they recorded Sam in the 1970s. And here we've even got one of the old characters. <laughs> and if you can't remember it, Mark McManus played Sam in the second series. There's gonna be a murder. <laughs> I can't do a Scots accent neither. <laughs> there's, a, there's a film crew here. All oh, right. Oh, and it looks actually like the filming now. By the way, did you know, a little fact, Mark McManus was the brother of Brian Connolly, who was lead singer for the suite. There you go. There's a throwaway pub quiz question. Brian! Leg it doors with his cousin Sam! Hey, George. Is your daddy? You went across pitfields without Frank. Oh, good. Oh, it's him. He's holding back. Else it's them bloody dogs he's wearing. Fred! Break my young Sam! V. He won't, yeah, he yeah. won't know what he's too young, isn't he? 1970s, 1974, 75. Yeah, yeah. What's the series called? It's, uh, it's a BBC series. But... Brilliant. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you look at... If you just YouTube Sam and look yeah. at it, the village is empty. I'm trying to think, well, where was what? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He's a good juggler. Yeah, he is, he's alright, isn't he? Uh, what a coincidence to film in here today. It's uh, an episode of Sherwood that's talk, you back, got an ex-miner in it, so the place is full of 80s cars and a nice old tranny van and all. Nice little exclusive from the Rosnill Colourage YouTube site. And the opening shots of Sam. I remember rightly, you see a bus coming up a cobbled road, dropping Sam and his mother off, and then his mother trails up to one of those houses, but it's a different street, and some nice people we've met, Chris and his wife. Reckon it, this is the road.
and your grand till I tell you. Wait for me at your Uncle George's. That's the Astley and Tilsley Miners' Welfare. Good how the name carries on though, isn't it? Even though there's no men left. The proximity to the village. You can get all of any old episodes of Sam. It was really good, even though it was the 1970s. It was a fantastic drama series, and the underground scenes were certainly very well done. I thoroughly recommend it. You rate about Baxter? Ah, seems he were hit by a tub over on gate two. George Barracuff found him. How did it happen? We're standing right by cutter engine. Didn't hear it coming, be all the camps. Is he a bad then? Bad as can be. Barracuff says he's dead. Poor bugger. Stuck in two women's cabin now till he's done his report. Right slow devil he is too. We told to the room woman all we know. They're full of laying to me for my supper being cold. I'm a late for girlfriend to Nate Allen. Which one? Shut up, Spikey. Running two now, that all. I said shut up. Get on with it. Well, that was fortuitous, wasn't it? It we certainly got... was. Eh? It certainly was. Well, that was fortuitous, wasn't it? And we got talking to a really nice couple down there as we were watching the filming who told us a little bit of... Uh, yeah, Dave. <laughs> Lights, camera, action. Who were telling us a little bit about the village um, and the fact that they put a wheel up here, one of the old pit wheels. But sadly, the remains of the colliery gym pit itself have been bulldozed down and new housing, although it was supposed to be kind of preserved. Well, at least they've put a few information boards up uh, and it has changed a lot since they filmed Sam. This is taken from an archaeological study um, basically drawn up by Ian Miller of the University of Salford and they had a really good look into the, the, the gym pit area before it was redeveloped and they did a proper archaeological study. So I'd encourage you, if you want to know more about it, to get all of this, but actually it's been turned into a book, although you can get it as a download on the internet. A gym pit was basically situated on the western edge of the Manchester coalfield, part of the Great Lancashire coalfield that stretched from the north of Burnley, across the Rosendale anticline, and then down towards the Cheshire Basin. Obviously the coals of uh, Manchester and Lee and Wigan were a lot deeper down in the strata, a lot deeper shafts than those up in Rosendale. Unlike the Great North East Coalfield, the Lancashire Coalfield was tied up totally with the uh, textile industry. Now, Gin Pit itself was sunk in the 1840s and a tram road was put down to the Bridgewater Canal and it, it, its rise was along with the growth in the cotton industry. It's interesting about the Lancashire cotton towns. All of them, with the exception of Preston, are situated on coal fields. Uh, in, interestingly, St. Helens, even though it has a coal industry, doesn't <laughs> have a cotton industry. Preston and St. Helens are the two exceptions. The pit became the property of the Astley and Tilsley Coal and Salt Company, and they deepened it to 375 yards down to the Rams Mine. By the late 1890s, it was employing about 240 men underground, around about 50-odd surface workers. Um, it was connected to St George's Colliery, what you can see now, because Jim Pitt just had a single shaft, and St George's was used for ventilation. Manchester Collieries later took over, when a lot of pits amalgamated in the 1930s. Then obviously it was nationalised in 1947 with the National Coal Board and sadly it ceased production in 1958. So the photographs we're seeing now are all from the archaeological study um, and it really would be good for you to get hold of a copy uh, and have a good read through because they uncovered a lot of the old artefacts where the shafts were, where the winding engines and pumping engines and really did give uh, good details of what it used to look like. And now sadly, as I said, well it's all been built over and it's a thing of the past. So a colliery village with a rich heritage now used as a film set. Well, having Googled the programme, the Sherwood programme, you can see it's just another programme to bring up more hatred, really, isn't it? They say that they're exploring different things on the, the strike and 
incidents, but all basically it's doing is perpetuating, in my opinion, it's just perpetuating the hatred. Just Let's just teach the great grandkids how to hate now, as if enough problems haven't been caused in these communities and families over the last 40 years or so. Go on, Morgan. In the 1980s, really were a big epoch changing era. era. Um, little did we really notice at the time, I was just fresh faced 16 year old leaving school and wanting to get to work at the pit like I'd always wanted to do. I was one of the last intake at Apton Valley in 1980. <clears throat> at that time, the western area <laughs> went from uh, Cumbria, from The Hague, all the way down to um, Bersham and Point of Air in in North Wales there, that was the western area, there was eight pits in the whole western area, that massive area. There used to be eight pits around Crosher Booth and Loughclough at one time. And I suppose it wasn't really hard to understand what was possibly about to happen. I don't want it in any way to be political, I'm not political, I just no time for them things. You study history and you see the folly in these things. I have great respect for people who stand up for what they believe in, as long as that doesn't cause any harm to somebody else. And obviously growing up as a kid, the three day week were just things, well, they just happened, didn't they? All we were more interested in was playing football, uh, who was winning the cup, and what was Slade's next single, so to speak, and that was about it. It wasn't until you enter the world of work and all these things suddenly kind of hit you. And my father had been a, an electrician and he'd started in the pit. Well, first of all, he went, after he'd served his time in Bay Cup, he went working on the Oswater Aqueduct as a tunneler, and then he went down Hilltop went into the pits, went bankrupt as a motorbike salesman in his shop and then went back down the pit again. But he'd been paid out in 1968 when Deerplay closed. And that, when Deerplay closed, just left three pits around the Rosendale and Burnley area. Bank Hall went then in, well, Old Meadows first in 69 and then Bank Hall in 1971, leaving just Apton Valley in an area of East Lancashire that had been full of pits. So, what are you going to tell these men about pit closures in the 1980s? Because they'd seen it in the 40s, 50s and the 1960s. Yeah, so, father, after his motorbike shop had gone down the tube in Leyland, he didn't have a good start really, his partner died just as soon as they opened the shop up, D&J Motorcycles. Like Randall and Opkirk, the J was deceased. So he went back to Hilltop. <clears throat> Well, he did a little bit at Chisnall Hall first, delivering coal in the morning, and then down Chisnall Hall as an electrician in the afternoon because he was made bankrupt. <laughs> now, what else he could do? Then he got back on at Hilltop as soon as he could. And when Hilltop shut in '66, like quite a lot of others, he ended up going to uh, Derplay. But when Derplay shut in '68, um, that was my father for the time being. <laughs> there was a guy in charge at Apton Valley that he wasn't so keen on. Uh, no names mentioned and I can't think of it possibly was. And he wasn't keen on Bank Hall neither because of the gas problem. Not with Apton Valley explosion, just not long in the, in the mind. So <clears throat> he went in the cotton mills. My man was there at, L at Lower Mill, at Fold Mill, where my great granddad had <laughs> gone in the 1880s, thereabouts. Uh, my man was a perm winder and father went working as an electrician. But Whitehead sold out I think it was to Lonrose, and they ended up going to Rhodesia. Uh, so the lower mill closed, and as far as I can think, lower mill must have been, apart from Longhome Shed, I think that was the last cotton mill in Rosendale. But I could, I could be wrong, but I only seem to remember Longhome Shed after that. So the, the, the Rosendale cotton industry, you know, uh, the Valley of Hope, what, what did they call the place? The Golden Valley. Yeah, well, I think when you read the history of it, the streets weren't exactly paved with gold for a lot of people. But anyway, so the cotton industry had left the Rosendale Valley, left most of Lancashire. So the coal industry wasn't on its own. It was to do with all heavy industries. In the 1980s, we had all the slipper work closures. We had all the steel work closures. And living up near where I do now on the Tyne, you've got all the ship work, shipyard closures. So... The coal was just a part and parcel of it. So my dad had gone back down the pit in 75 
after uh, Lower Mill Close. He'd gone back to Acton Valley. Bob Baldwin, who was an old friend of his, got him on there. And when I started in 1980, um, it had potentially 25 years of coal, all the way under the Burnley Basin, under all the old alley workings, right across to fence. All untouched coal, all proven reserves in two seams. 25 years of mining. But it didn't happen. <clears throat> I'll call everybody by Mr and Mrs for out of respect. But things were changing. And obviously we know <laughs> there was new... A new efforts to close the coal industry, um, perhaps even attack the, the NUM, who knows? I'm not getting involved in that particular argument. But there was new activity to do that. And there was a big pit closure list. I've had this argument with a few people. There was a... <laughs> I was seven, 16, 17, full of ideals. I know what went on at the time. And I was a, a mining anorak even then. <clears throat> now, Apton Valley was one of those on that closure list. I remember we voted to strike, I was at Tech at the time, and even our mining instructor, an ex-manager, told us to go and vote, it's your democratic right. And so there you are, young idealistic lad, 16 <laughs> year old, proud as punch that you're in the NUM and there's strike ballot. Crazy really. But anyway, the, the hit list was reneged on. Well, we know it was like 20, 1925 really, wasn't it, where they just <laughs> bought time. But anyway, that closure list was reneged on, apart from two. Apton Valley and Victoria Colliery in Stoke. <clears throat> now I was at the union meeting that Sunday morning in the Unity Club. I don't know what time it started, 10 o'clock. One or two had already had a few pints, because always a few checks for a few free pints, isn't there? Get your... Get your liberal up a little bit. And the Lancashire area secretary at the time was a guy called Sid Vincent. And I'll never forget his speech. Well, I'll never forget the first minute of his speech because that was all that was, that even wasn't worth listening to. He got up on the podium in the Unity Club and he said, Pit shut, lads. Jobs down the road. Agecroft, in other words. And he spent the next half hour outlining all the redundancy terms. So that was my experience. My dad at 55, he'd been paid out in 68 at Deer Play, a couple of hundred quid, that was it. Well, you wouldn't find him another job at 55. He was an electrician, good electrician. Um, charge hand at the time and all. Wouldn't give him another job, he was finished. He didn't talk about that very much. He just bought his council house. My mum left him. So obviously as a Wait, 16, 17 year old, I didn't really understand what father went through. So there he was, 55, no job. Who's going to employ a 55 year old? Well, thankfully, um, one of his friends did, a guy that used to be an apprentice of his up at Deer Play, found him some work, cash in hand, so to speak. He made a, an honest man, sort of dishonest, really. But it, under, the, under the regulations, from the coal board, under his uh, redundancy terms, he couldn't get another job at another pit because he would lose that redundancy. Don't ask me, it was to do with the pension, it was crazy. <clears throat> so anyway, after a couple of years, when most of the redundancy, and it wasn't a lot, had gone, we had the bailiffs at the door. I answered the door one night, I think I was working at Royd Wood at the time, driving Royd Wood, and uh, I answered the door, still in my pit muck, and there was, uh, the bailiff there, why is the mortgage not paid? So I didn't realise how low my father had got. So we all suffered in a way and it made me a little bit bitter watching what happened to that guy. Fortunately, I'd had a handy motorbike accident so the debt was sort of quickly squared up with a compensation for the motorbike. But we all have different, we all have different experiences. The point was we had to get on and we did get on. Uh, what else can you do? Now my attitude to it was I got to start at Agecroft, but my my ambition had always been to own my own private mine, just like Billy Clayton. You see, catching the school bus coming home from Fearns, I'd seen Father George and Bob and them coming home on the bus. I, swear, I always wanted to do that. So rather than go to Agecroft, I went to see Father Bill, 
and got on up there. And part of my reasoning was, if they came to shut Grime Bridge, well, Billy would fight for that because his house was mortgaged against the pit. There'd be no redundancy payments. Like I said, I'd got on at the private mine. And uh, Father Bill wanted a bit of electric work doing. So I know a guy that can do a bit of that because it was on the surface. And my dad came up and he never looked back. But for a while, a couple of years, times were really, really hard. And I used to get bitter about it. I mean, as a young 17, 18 year old, I couldn't really see exactly what was going on in his mind and what had happened to him. All I could think about, like most 17, 18 year olds, was a girlfriend, the pub, and a band, and maybe some football as well. I've sat and thought about it since, and I've been in a similar position, and I know what it must have done to the guy. But you've just got to get up and get on. And we did, and my dad was still going into the 90s working for Father Bill. And at the end up, he mightn't have had much money. He had enough just to get by, but he still had a life. And that's what I find about these programs. All it does is spread more hatred. And you know, life's short. But that's my take on things. I appreciate everybody's different. And uh, like I said, I don't want to be political. So obviously I don't mean that in a belittling way. Um, I found myself that in life, <clears throat> bad things happen to you and you either let them become lessons or life sentences. You know, a choice not always yours. There's lots of difficult things to contend with, but that was our experience. <clears throat> People tend to want a, a guy to put on the bonfire, don't they? Somebody easy to blame. Um, and that really, the situation in the 1980s brought that situation. You either wanted to burn Mr. Scargill on the bonfire or burn Mrs. Thatcher on the bonfire. Easy. One enemy, one body. And even if you look back at the 1980s, you know, revisit Bleasdale's boys from the black stuff and things like that, you forget it's 40 years ago how stark the times were. I was lucky, I got a job. I had mates that were on the, the YTS, left school just to be on the door. It was hard, <clears throat> and we'd forgotten, I think, what it was like. And yet we had a new music scene at the time, didn't we? Where it was very hedonistic. You know, you can have this, Harry Enfield with loads of money. Um, the Big Bang happened in the financial industry. Well, that's because the whole situation goes back decades and decades. It wasn't just something that happened in the 1980s. Once you sort of realise that, you start looking into what really did happen globally. Um, and my sort of research has brought me down into the path of neoliberalism. And if you look at the growth of neoliberalism after the Second World War, probably before really, uh, and the rise in technocracy, you see that this plan has been on the go for a long time. It's not just the closing of Western industry, it was also the col sort of colonisation, if you will, of the, the middle of the Far East. Places like the Philippines and East Timor and places like that that were, as they quoted, opened up for business. Yeah because all the industries of the West went across there. It was a plan, and it was reenacted over, well, over many decades. And sadly, people are given a goodie and a baddie to look at and blame them, and not everybody looks into what really happened. But I would invite you to do so, because nothing could have stopped the march, the progress that happened, it was set in, in motion, as I say, after the Second World War, the end of Keynesian economics and the beginning of neoliberalism, which in the West really got a hold with Mrs. Thatcher, Ronald Reagan. Remember, they're just people, people are figureheads. There's massive organizations behind them. Uh, and this was a massive push to change world economics uh, into a global structure. So, all I could say, that's a big long sermon, isn't it? And I, I don't want to be political and I respect anybody that stands up for what they believe in. And I w want people to uh, celebrate the things about the mining industry that should be celebrated. Um, and nobody wants anybody's lives to be any the worse, do they? And uh, filled with hatred about something we can't do anything about and has now gone.
and throw them on. Dripping in bread next door to your grams and finish it off there before it melts. Temperature's rising in here. Well, ask her if she's got a slice or two of bread to lend me. Uh, have you got your coat? Mm. <laughs> yeah, there they are. Off you go then. Oh, and um, say goodbye to your Uncle George. From the look of him, he might not be here when you get back. Bye, Uncle George. like that in front of him. There was some explanation due. Explanation for what? For grown-up behaviour. Ethel, I'm home. Now you come cocking the mitten with me, my lad. Saw so my mum take too much of that from my dad to take it from you. And your mum and all come to that. I've had no treat yet. Well, it's not surprising, is it? You've not been in the house two minutes. Go and get yourself under the tap. I'll eat mucky. You leak cleaner, not at all. I'm off upstairs to finish the beds. When you've come out from under the tap, let me know. Your appetite. I'm eating mucky. Not in this house. I'll stop it till I do. Oh, well, they'll lay the out on the table then, won't they? That worms will eat mucky. So the sooner you stop sulking. I'm not sulking. I'm just sick of not knowing whether I've summoned or not. Two short weeks in a row, just sat there waiting to be taken on. You'll be short on spends then. How much, George? Penny? Tuppence? Threepence farthing? I'll get the wages. As I'll manage. Uh, and I shall have to put up with the managing, shan't I? So I want to see what you manage on. I want your wage, George. All of it. I'll give you thy wage when I've checked my spends. I shall give you your spends when you give me your wage. It's that Jackie Littlewood's missus, isn't it? By God, he started somewhere on this street when he handed his full wage over, did young chap? He didn't hand it over, George. Clarice put her foot down. Ah, and now he's a laughing stock. Well, that's not seeing my wage. So they can shove a cork in it. I can shove a cork in it, I can. No point in making a long hard road of it, George. We'll get there in the end. Ah, oh, but we shall not, I knows. We can drop it now. Just one of them little things we've got to have out. Been from one thing to the other. And we've got this on the agenda. We shall get there in the end. I shall not move from here, you know. I shall not move a bloody inch. I'm hungry. Do you understand? I'm hungry. 